Welcome to God is Open. I'm your host, Christopher Fisher. Today on God is Open, we're going to be reviewing the book Plotinus or Simplicity of Vision. Of course, Plotinus, as we all know, is a Neoplatonist philosopher who lived just before Augustine and it had a major effect on Augustine. So much so that Augustine's dying words were a quote from Plotinus. And his friends said, oh, Augustine, throughout your works are the words of Jesus, Plato, and Plotinus. This, this is the people that they loved in the ancient world. This, this, was, this was the philosophy de jour that everyone went to. This is their default, their default high thinking, critical thought philosophy. So Pierre Hadot, he wrote this book. He is a French scholar of world fame. He is an expert in ancient philosophy, particularly Neoplatonism. Now he died, he died in 2010, but uh, he was pretty active. This book, I think, was written back in the 60s. I can't find a digital version of this, so we'll have to go after, after uh, this manual version today. I'll have to be reading quotes directly from the book. Uh, you know, we're back in the Middle Ages with the physical books, but we're going to have to do it because this is a good book and a great resource on the ancient world. He, he loves the ancient world. He quotes things about the ancient world. He talks about how, how they thought in this time period. Their, their criticisms of in the incarnation. Remember around the third century AD, all the Christians were like, Oh, uh, what's what's the nature of God and, and the Trinity? And they had all the debates there. That, that's what they cared about was how does the physical interact with the spiritual? And Plotinus weighed in on the issue, of course. The Gnostics weighed in on the issue. And uh, these are the things, this is the type of thinking that they cared about. He also talks about in the last chapters the biographical information of Plotinus. And he, he uses a lot of quotes and uh a lot of footnotes referencing both Ambrose and Augustine, who relied heavily on Plotinus for a lot of their teachings. For example, Augustine's idea that the evil is privation of the good. This came from, of course, Ambrose, who was quoting Plotinus. Or Augustine, of course, might have got directly from Plotinus. Augustine didn't really like to quote his sources. He'd just throw little quotes out there, and then you have to find those previous quotes, like especially when he quotes Origin of Alexandria. Uh, you just don't know unless you're familiar with both works that he, what he's doing. But Plotinus it was a heavy influence in Christianity, especially Ambrose and Augustine. So very important to know, the very important philosopher in the history of the development of Christianity. Huge, major effects, long-lasting effects on Christian thought, Christian doctrine, even ideas of Trinity come from Plotinus' ideas of how the world is laid out. So Plotinus, uh, overview of his work. There, there's a small paragraph in here I'd like to read to you that kind of summarizes his work, and then we'll turn to the last pages to summarize his life. It is precisely this movement we shall find in Plotinus' works. His treatises are spiritual exercises in which the soul sculpts herself, that is, she purifies and simplifies herself, rises up on a plane of pure thought, and finally transcends herself in ecstasy. This, this is the Platonic ascent. This is the simplicity of vision. This is the goal of every good Platonist uh, philosopher, is to transcend reality, to reunite with the one, to get rid of all external influences and focus and contemplate, lead a contemplative life. When Plotinus was dying, here are his last words to one of his disciples. I didn't want to die without seeing you again, my last friend, my only disciple who stayed with me. But you took your time getting here. I had to postpone my departure because of you. There are very simple words, which in any other context, we might just say, oh, he's just going to die. That's what his departure is. But within the context of Plotinus's teaching, all these words take on a brand new meaning. As is written here, Pir Hadat, Plotinus's soul, made one with the soul of the universe, is going to contemplate the divine spirit and its ineffable source, the holy, simple good. That's Plotinus's idea. He is dying. He is ascending. He is transcending the material and reuniting with the one. Uh, this is the, a beautiful a phrase. It's a very poetic, his, his dying last words, transcending to the one. So things we know about Plotinus, his biographical information. Of course, uh, Plotinus really didn't like to talk about himself because 
you know, a good philosopher doesn't focus on the self. They focus on the ideas. The self, the body, is just a shell. What we care about is is ideas, information, the, the introspective life, the virtue, the good, enlightenment. Those those are the good values of any philosopher. And so he didn't even want to have his own portrait taken. This is the type of man we're dealing with here. So Plotinus was born in 205, roughly around there, probably in Egypt. He was a disciple of Ammonius Sactus, who was also the teacher of Origin of Alexandria. You see some common roots and common themes. The Origin of Alexandria was very Platonistic individual, talked a lot of the same concepts as the Neoplatonists. We have him dying in about 270 A.D., Throughout his time, you know, he, he became fairly prominent as a teacher in Rome. And uh, he was well sought out. He moved in, in pretty high circles. Their no, nobility sent them their children to, to train, to, to be taught. And rest assured, th those children are pre in pretty good hands because uh, he, he just wanted the introspective life. He didn't care about anything in the physical world. He wanted to train everyone to be like the ascetics, you know, the Christian ascetics who want to live and, and just not eat anything. He would maybe eat once every couple days is, is the idea of this assure life where, where you're just focusing on contemplation rather than your physical well-being. This book speaks about Plotinus in heliographic terms. It seems the Pir Hadat really liked Plotinus. He himself is probably an uh, affiliate of Neoplatonism himself possibly being being a practitioner uh, very glowing terms for Plotinus probably more so than I would give him so they're like the same information about Plotinus that I would criticize Plotinus about Pierre Hadot would praise him for this is a very friendly book so it's it's very much likely that he's truly representing Plotinus's true thoughts and his true ideas and his true philosophy being possibly a true believer in this philosophy. We turn now to Hadat's overview of the ancient world at this time. During the first three centuries of the Christian era witnessed a flourishing of Gnosticism and mystery religions. Plotinus has a lot of works that uh, counter counter the Gnostics. As these were the one of the people he interacted with. Ban felt himself to be a stranger in this lower world as if he had been banished into his body and the sensible world. See, this is what they're caring about. They're caring about the material body that you want to reject to return, return to the spiritual realm. The popularization of Platonism was in part responsible for this collective mentality. The body was considered a tomb and a prison. The soul was to separate herself from it. Because she was akin to the eternal ideas, our true self was to be held purely spiritual. Astral theologies, too, must be taken into account according to these. The soul is of celestial origin and has come down here via a stellar voyage, during the course of which she has become encased in ever thicker envelopes, the last of which is terrestrial body. And so the Christians will claim that souls are created things. Souls are created by God, maybe upon conception. Uh, the Platonistic idea and ideas also positive by Origen of Alexandria, who was a Christian, but he, is a, he, he, he lived at a point in time where his ideas were not considered heretical by the church. So he was a popular expositor of Platonistic values, such as the souls being uncreated and fallen from the spiritual wor wor world. These are Platonistic values. This age was disgusted by the body. This, moreover, was one of the reasons for the pagan hostility towards the mystery of the Incarnation. As Pulfrey put it clearly, now Pulfrey was a disciple of Plotinus and wrote a book against the Christians. How can we admit that the divine became an embryo, and after its birth it was wrapped up in swaddling clothes, covered with blood, bile, and even worse things? Remember the Valentinian Gnostics? claimed that Jesus was an actual real physical human being. He, he ate and drank uh, divinity. He didn't poop or have bodily excretions, anything like that. So a very major concern in early Christianity was the divine being physical. Paul writes about this in Colossians 2, in which he has to fight against the proto-Gnostics or the Platonists and actually have to argue that Jesus was divinity embodied. This, this is a real argument that the Christians had to face, this idea of a separation between the material and the spiritual, this, this chasm which cannot, cannot be fulfilled. Moving on, 
One could say that every philosophy of this period tried to explain the presence of this divine soul in a terrestrial body. Each was responding to the ancient interrogation of men who felt like strangers in this lower world. Who were we? What have we become? Where were we? Into what have we been hurled? Where are we going? Whence can liberation come to us? Here's a quick overview of the Gnostics, and so I, I like this paragraph. It's worth uh, quoting. Within Plotinus's school itself, some people answered this Gnostic question with a reply particular to Gnosticism. For the Gnostics, souls had fallen into the sensible universe as a result of the drama beyond their control. An evil power had created the sensible universe, and souls were imprisoned in it against their will. Even though they were particles of the spiritual world, still, since they came from the spiritual world, they still retain their spiritual nature. Their misfortune resulted only from the place in which they happened to be. At the end of the world, when the evil power would be defeated, their ordeal would be over. They would return to the plemora, or spiritual worlds. Salvation thus came from outside the soul and consisted in a change of place. It was dependent on the struggle between superior powers. So in the Gnostic view, there's the Gnostic enlightenment. You had access to a particular knowledge which would give you access to the spiritual world. In Plotinus's view, this knowledge is not exclusive to any certain individuals. There's not a certain enlightened individuals like there is in Gnosticism. Yet people can lead a contemplative life to access that for themselves. Also, Plotinus criticized the Gnostics for not having a series of ethics or, or virtues or in Plotinus's religion, in his, his thought, was once you attain to the spiritual, once you achieve that ascent, that unity to the spiritual, you now had to live by a contemplative life to try to refocus yourself and to read guide yourself back to that unity. Whereas in Gnosticism, that Gnostic knowledge was the uniting principle, and so it didn't matter what they did on earth. They still had their escape clause that allowed them to transcend the material universe. So in Plotinus's theory, in his, his philosophy, there is a system of ethics, what you should do, how you should live, and one of which was to deprive of yourself of anything that would, that would take your contemplation off of God. I know some some Christians in the modern world say whatever you focus on the most that's your idol you know like all our focus has to be on God well I don't think that's really a biblical concept you just have to love God you know that's that's one of the things we're called to do is to love God in the Bible uh, not not one of these you know focus everything on him and neglect everything of the world don't go to any movies or go to any dances never take a drink of alcohol no in that but in plotinus in his theology in his his idea of how you live is you get rid of any element of your life that is pulling you away from the contemplative life taking you away of from that focus on reuniting with the spiritual world I'm going to read this very rare passage in, in Plotinus's work. He, he really doesn't talk about himself. He talks about concepts, ideas, principles. So you don't have any autobiographical information that Plotinus typically writes, but he did achieve ascent. Ascent is a contemplation where you move from the material world to the spiritual, and hopefully you attain to the one and find yourself at the highest level of existence. He writes this, I often reawaken from my body to myself. I come to be outside other things and inside myself. What an extraordinary, wonderful beauty I then see. It is then above all that I believe I belong to the greater portion. I then realize the best form of life. I have become at one with the divine and I have established myself in it. Once I reach this supreme activity, I establish myself above every other spiritual entity. After this repose in the divine, however, when I come back down from the intuition into the rational thought, I then wonder, how is it possible that I should come down now? And how is it ever possible that my soul has come to be within my body, even though she is the kind of being that she just revealed herself to be when she appeared as she was in herself, although she was still within the body? You see this moment where Plotinus, he achieves this spiritual ascent to the one where he envisions this ineffable being and he becomes one with it. There's there's no distinction once he attains this enlightenment. And then he wakes up in his body and he has to wonder why his soul would be allowed to come back down through the levels into his material body after it had tasted the one. And in Plotinus' thought, it's because his soul didn't have the vigor to hold on to that transaction long enough and it, ha and it had to be sent back down to the lower realms. We read his confusion, his longing, his, 
his bewilderment, his he he doesn't understand why he couldn't attain permanently. So a real quick overview of the different levels of Platonic thought. The top, of course, was God. God was this ineffable one, purely simple, outside of space, time, had no predicates, uh, it, incomprehensible. This is the pure, pure, uh, what is it? Pure aseity, aseity, pure actuality. This, this has no predicates. This is the one in Platonism. Under that, you have the realm of the intellect, which is the realm of the forms. This is a more perfect uh, spiritual realm, which, which, uh, has, has a lot more beauty, we would say, than, than the lower realm. We live in the realm of the soul, which is the material world. And we have to retranscend up through the level of the intellect into the level of the one in order to attain oneness, uh, attain transcendence with the one. That was the goal of every good Platonist. So the terms are important, the concepts are important, and these concepts carry over to Christianity. You'll see in a lot of systematic theologies that people define God as Plotinus defines the one. These, these are one and the same. And Plotinus, was, of course, was not the innovator of these terms and ideas. And the earliest concepts we find of this is in the Gnostics, who themselves were Platonists. And Platonism all goes all the way down. You know, turtles all the way down, Platonism all the way down the line. So in the Platonistic mindset, every individual had descended from these higher realms. They were living in a lower realm. So what we needed to do was we needed to use our senses to reattain. He says this, We must not look, but must, as it were, close our eyes and exchange our faculty of vision for another. We must awaken this faculty which everyone possesses, but few people ever use. So everyone has the capability to ascend to the one, unlike the Gnostics, unlike the Calvinists, who believe there's a certain elect, and those elect are the ones who are allowed attaining the the salvation or or you know the attainment in the spiritual world so not like that every single individual has the ability to attain to the higher yet hardly anyone ever uses it go back to plato's allegory of the cave remember plato had the allegory of the cave in which there's people who see shadows on the wall there's people passing up above who project the shadows on the wall and the people in the cave think the shadows are reality until one day one of the people in the cave they go higher, they get above the shadows, and they see what actually is occurring. They see the light, they see the colors, they see the people walking, and then they go back down to the cave, and they try to explain to the cave dwellers that the shadows aren't reality. That reality is instead up there in the light with the people passing by. And the people down below in the cave don't believe them, and he, they like get mad at him, and they want to kill him and stuff like that. That was the idea of this transcending to the one. That our current reality that we're living in, in the words of Plato, is kind of like a stage act where everyone has has their little pieces to play. They they have their little costumes. Some people play good people. Some people play bad people. Some people play princes. Some people p play pirates. Uh, some people play merchants. We all are living in this shadow puppet world that doesn't actually exist. Doesn't actually have real meaning. What really has meaning is the upper levels, the, the play above the play. And Plotinus borrows on Plato's language in, in, the, in this analogy. In the true dramatic creation, which is partially imitated by people of a poetical nature, the soul is an actress. She gets the role she plays from the poet. Just as the actors in this world do not receive at random their masks, their costumes, their expensive robes, their ragged clothes, so be it with the soul herself. She does not receive her fortunes at random. He believed in some sort of predestination. The evil in this world had purpose. The evil was eternally predestined to fit into a larger role. But they too are in accordance with reason. So the roles we play, the evil in this world, serves function, it serves purpose. If the soul adapts them to herself, she becomes harmonious and coordinates herself with the drama as well as with the whole of reason. The bodies we wear, they're, they're just our play stage, our masks. Our, our, our real life experiences is the soul. The body's just a shell. And that doesn't mean we neglect and just kill ourselves or anything like that in Plotinus's idea. But we do have to minimize our surroundings. We have to 
focus on that contemplative life and do whatever can most maximize our contemplative experience. And just killing yourself is not going to maximize your contemplative experience. It's interesting that he faults the evils to the body. Like, for example, the Christian concept of original sin, as we find in Augustine, highly drawn from same ideas found in Plotinus. He writes this, even though we are caught up in such evils, though the fault of our bodies, God have, has given us virtue which knows no master. He also writes, The nature of this higher soul in us is separate from all blame for the evil deeds, either committed or undergone by a man. For these evil deeds have to do with the common animal. The common animal, of course, is our soulish nature, is our physical body. His idea was the further away we get from the one, the more change that's introduced into the world, the, the further deprivation from the good, that's evil. Evil is a deprivation of the good. So moving on to the Platonic Ascent. In the ideas of Plotinus, Platonic Ascent starts with a love. Now this is not human love. This is not like a man loves a woman or anything like that. This love is this idea that the different levels trump each other in, in desire. Well, we'll read this paragraph here. On the contrary, when Plotinus uses the language of fair dress, this is Plato's work, it is not, as it was for Plato, in order to describe human love, but rather to immediately express a mystical experience. For Plotinus, human love is no longer a starting point or first stage in a gradual ascent, but has become a mere term of comparison. It is only a reflection of that genuine love which is infused in the soul by the good, and it disappears without the advent of the latter. Let's read from Plotinus. The soul loves the good because, from the beginning, she has been incited by the good to love him. The good is the one. The good is God. And the soul which has this love at hand does not wait to be reminded by the beauties of this lower world. But since she has this love, even if she does not realize it, she is constantly searching. She... Since she wants to rise up to the good, the soul disdains the beauties of this world. The good is a drawing force pulling upwards. When she sees the beautiful things in this universe, she mistrusts them, for she sees that they are in flesh and in bodies, and that they are polluted by the present dwelling place. When the soul further sees that the beauties of this world flow away, she knows full well that the light which was shimmering upon them comes from elsewhere. You know, change, decay, you know, that, that shows us that these things are lesser than the spiritual realm, lesser than the realm of the one. And the, the realms, those higher realms, pull us upwards. The soul then rises up to the other world, for she is clever at finding what she loves. And she does not give up before she has seized it, unless her love were somehow torn away from her. In true form to a platonic ascent, uh, Hadat writes this, To prepare herself for the coming of the good, the soul must leave behind all inner activity, distinct representation, self-will, and individual possessions. The good itself is, after all, without form. So the good's without form, so we must get rid of anything that causes any sort of distinction in us, any sort of uh, predicates. You know, we need to purge ourselves of predicates. We will not be surprised to see the object which produces such an urgent desire. This is from Plotinus. Completely free of all form, even intelligible. When the soul feels passionate love for him, she pulls aside all shapes she has, including whatsoever form of the intelligible may be within her, for it is impossible either to see him or be adjusted with him while in possession and acting upon anything other than him. So in the Platonic world, in the world of Plotinus, at introspective meditation, it causes the ascent, uh, divorcing yourself from the world, divorcing yourself from, from the thoughts, the desires, the cares of this world, uh, self-actualization or what sexual urges, you know, that was also disdained upon. There was a biographical sketch of uh, Plotinus where there was a homosexuality reference in one of the plays that he was watching and he, he wanted to leave in disgust because you know what that is, is it's the sensual lust, the, those types of things. They, they tie us to the physical world. Uh, possibly why in Catholicism, you know, they don't allow their priests to marry because uh, that's tied to this idea, this disdain for sex that was pretty commonplace in this time period. If you guys remember Jerome, Jerome, he was a, a Christian around Rome. And what he would do, his thing was going around to young widows and trying to convert them to perpetual chastity. You know, that was his big value set, a complete nutter. Um, this is what these people cared about. They thought this this was the Christian life, is complete chastity, no sex. 
uh, uh, Plotinus. This is a Platonic value. This is not a Christian value. So although the one is kind of quote unquote in this physical world, it's not really in this physical world. You have to think of the physical world as a mask layer that that doesn't have any spatial location relative to the, the spiritual world. You know, you find this at a lot of Christians, modern Christians will claim this as well. If God is spiritual, he cannot also have location, which is kind of weird. Genesis in Genesis 1, the spirit of God was hovering over the formless void. Uh, that's what's going on there. So in the Jewish mindset, the, the spiritual could have physical dimensions. They, they could be on the same plane as reality. But not in Platonism. In Platonism, you you know, the, the, the light and the lightning doesn't come from outside of ourselves or inside of ourselves. It's just there or not there. You're you're attaining to a different realm. You're you're transposing. It's kind of like the matrix. You're waking up in a new reality that doesn't have doesn't have any connection to the re reality below it. it. Says suddenly a light bursts forth, pure and alone. We wonder whence it came, from outside or from inside. Once it disappears, we say it was inside, and yet no, it wasn't inside. We must not try to learn whence or came or for where it's going. For here, there is no whence. The light comes from nowhere, and it goes nowhere. It simply either appears or does not appear. This is why we must not chase after it, but quietly wait for it to appear, preparing ourselves to be spectators as the eye waits for the rising sun. The sun appears over the horizon, coming out of the ocean, as the poets say, and allows the eye to behold it. So once you reach this attainment, uh, this is this is where in in the language of Augustine, you're reading confession, and he says, "I saw with my inner eye that you are unchangeable." This is a Platonistic value. They went through these uh, meditative ascents to the One in order to find information about God to really experience God. The, this this is the language that's pretty commonplace in Platonism. If you don't understand Platonism, you're probably not reading Augustine right. The inner eye is our spiritual ascent, is our experiences in this non-physical realm while we're attained at this higher state of being. It is not always a foreign exterior light which the eye knows, sometimes before the exterior light, but holds it in an instant, a light more brilliant and akin to itself. Sometimes it leaves forth from it in the darkness at night, and others the eye does not wish to look at any other thing. It shuts its eyelids before it, and yet still emits light. Finally, if one presses down on his eye, he sees the light within it. In this case, he sees without seeing, and it is then that he sees more than ever. For what he is seeing is light. Other things are only illuminous, but they're not light itself. This is Plotinus. Plotinus also writes, carried off as it were by the wave of the spirit itself, lifted up high by it as if it were swollen. He suddenly saw without seeing how, but the spectacle filling the eyes with light did not cause some other object to be seen by its means. Rather, what was seen was light itself. It is not that there were two things within it, on the one hand a visible object, on the other its light, nor was there a spirit. And when what was thought by spirit, there is only dazzling light, which engenders all things later on. So at the pinnacle of this state, we become one with the all. And uh, as Plotinus writes, there, there becomes no distinction. You, you lose any focus on self. You lose any distinction between yourself and the object you're perceiving. In the Platonic religion, the one perceives itself perfectly and not at all because the one is above predicates, above intellectuality. It can't actually have thoughts. A thought is a change. A thought is a discourse of thinking. And the one is above those types of thoughts. So you know, in, in Calvinism, in Augustinian Christianity, the one has this innate knowledge of all things that is identical to oneself. This is a Platonic value where the one can't actually go about reasoning. It can't go about successive thoughts. The, the one is above that. The one, the one can't have change like that. The one can't have parts. That would create parts. That would create distinction. And so in the Platonic Ascent, once you achieve unity to the one, you gain that unity. You, you gain that simplicity. You lose all, all idea of predicates. You lose all idea of self, of other. You become the one ineffable with that one. So as we already read, Plotinus comes down from his vision and he's dismayed because now he's back in his material world. He wants to reascend to the one. He, he just had his uh, ecstatic, uh, his, his ecstasy experience where he attained true enlightenment. And, and you find other attempts at enlightenment. You have Augustine several times that he records that he, 
he attained or near attained enlightenment in his introspective uh, works, his introspective uh, attempts. And we don't know how many unrecorded attempts that he had tried as well or attained as well. But uh, this, this is a common Platonic value, probably dropped by the time of Calvin. I don't think Calvin was introspective, uh, attain unity to the one. But it was pretty kosher at this time that these were, this was the value set. Platonism was in vogue and was celebrated. So once Plotinus comes down from his unity with the one, he's dismayed. Uh, why, why, why can't I just stay with the one? You know, now how do I live life? And he writes about being amphibious, which, which is a play on words, as Hadot writes. It's a play on words, the Greek words. Soul necessarily becomes, as it were, amphibious. This is Plotinus writing. Alternatively, living the life up above and the life here down below. And Hadot's commentary in the footnotes is, there is etymological pun here. The Greek word ampi means of both kinds, and bios, life, being combined to form amphiboi, living a double life. As in English, so in Greek the term was normally used to designated animals, especially frogs. You know, we're now amphibious once we attain with the one. Now we're living in this world, but we're living not as if we were servants of this world, but we are living as we're, we don't have a place in either world. We don't have a place in the material world. We don't have the place with the one because we were or pulled back down to the soul world. And so Plotinus had to wonder, now how then shall I live? And this is where he set up his system of virtues that we already touched about briefly. Here is Hadat. How then shall we live? For Plotinus, the great problem is to learn how to live in our day-to-day -day life. We must learn to live after contemplation in such a way that we are once again prepared for contemplation. We must concentrate ourselves within, gathering ourselves together to a point where we can always be ready to receive the divine presence when it manifests itself again. Remember, in Platonism, the light comes and goes. We, we don't control when the light overtakes us and brings us to ascent with the one. We have to just wait for it, and we have to prepare ourselves for that possible unity in the future. We must detach ourselves from the life down here to such an extent that the contemplation can become a continuous state. Nevertheless, we have to learn how to put up with day-to-day -day life. Better still, we must learn to illuminate it with clear light that comes from contemplation. For this, in turn, a lot of the work is required. Interior purification, simplification, and unification. Pierre Hadot, one of his goals in this book is, is this book is a form of advocacy towards people who will prefer a Platonic life, trying to convince them that modern day living, day to day life is worth living and worth living to the fullest. He, he doesn't want people to commit suicide and try to escape the world or, or try to, to neglect all aspects of reality. And he, he goes through the, in his bio, biographical section trying to argue that Plotinus did move in different circles. He moved in a pretty high, high political circles and he even tried to found his own on Plato City, a city based on Plato's ideas as expressed in Plato's Republic, idea where the contemplative life is of supreme value. So Plotinus didn't fully withdraw himself from all the world. And Hadad argues it seems like it seems like his subject audience of this book are people who might want to do that retreat into nothingness and not not proselytize. So possibly this book is designed to tell Platonists to go proselytize. I don't know. I don't know. That's what's kind of reading to me. I found this paragraph interesting. Of course, the Gnostics had their idea that their Gnostic knowledge allowed them allowed them unity with the higher realms, which was rejected by Plotinus. And Plotinus wrote against the Gnostics. And here's one of his paragraphs. Perhaps the Gnostics will say that their doctrine causes us to flee from the body and to hate it from a distance, whereas ours attaches the soul to the body. But it is as if two people were living in the same well-built house. One of them criticizes its structure and its builder, although he keeps on living in it all the same. The other, however, does not criticize. In fact, he affirms the builder has constructed the house with consumerate skill, and he awaits the time when he'll move on and no longer have need of the house. He who finds fault with the nature of the universe does not know what he is doing, nor how far his arrogance is taking him. The reason is that they do not know about the successive order of things from the first to the second to the third and down to the last things, do nor do they know that we must not abuse those things which are lower than the first, but gently acquiesce in the nature of all things. 
Remember, in Plotinus's idea, even the evil in this world is, is structured specifically to be part of a bigger, beautiful painting. The evil has purpose, and, and uh, you know, in the Calvinist theology, all evil has purpose. There's no, no such thing as purposeless evil. Uh, there's always some sort of greater good that comes out of it. This is Plotinus' teaching on evil. Here is Hadat. Evil is part of the nature of things, and for the sage it is a salutary test. One of Plotinus's first writings had already expressed this idea, Plotinus. In those whose facilities are too weak for them to be able to know evil by the mere faculty of knowledge prior to any experience, the experience of evil makes the knowledge of the good more clear. So evil makes knowledge of the good more clear. Elsewhere, Plotinus writes, some things, such as poverty and illness, benefit those who suffer them. Evil, however, contributes something useful to all. A paradigm of justice, moreover, it provides in and of itself many useful side effects. It wakens us up and awakes the spirit and intelligence, and we are forced to stand against the inroads of wrongdoing. It makes us learn how great a good is virtue by comparison with the evils, which are the lot of wrongdoers. Now it is not for this purpose that evils came about, but since they have come about, the world makes use for them as appropriate. This is a sign of the greatness of power, to be able to make good use of evils. Of course, as we already talked about, evil in Plotinus's idea is a deprivation of the good. This is Hadot writing, Evil is not extraneous to the order of the universe, rather it is a result of this order. Not everything can have the same rank, and the farther things are from the primal source, which is the absolute good, the more they are deprived of goodness. Evil, therefore, is nothing other than a privation of goodness. A footnote to this talks about Ambrose's use of this. this we already talked about this a little bit. St. Ambrose repeated this point of Plotinus' teaching in his sermon on Isaac. Quid ergo es multa nisi boni? In Dictionia, what else is evil but the lack of the good? This doctrine was to have a great influence on St. Augustine, as has been shown by P. Cancel, 1950. I love all the footnotes on Ambrose and Augustine. He just footnotes them as if it's common knowledge. It's common knowledge in uh, knowledge of ancient philosophy that Ambrose and Augustine were good Platonists. They, they followed the Platonistic worldview. They quoted the Platonists. They loved the Platonism. No one denies this, but a couple uh, evangelicals who really want to deny history. Anyways, this uh, podcast has probably gone long enough. Very interesting book uh, that tells you all about the Platonic Ascent, how to attain it, what it meant. What, what is the core philosophy of Plotinus? How did he think? I will, I'll just leave us with a closing thought about Plotinus and his idea of attaining to the One. Here's Hadot writing. Plotinus' soul, made one with the soul of the universe, is going to contemplate the divine spirit and its ineffable source, the holy simple good. And then we call to mind the strangely beautiful phrases he used to invoke the presence of God. You have said, I am of such and such dimensions, but you have dropped the such and such and have become the all. To be sure, you were already previously the all. When one comes to be someone, that is, by the addition of non-being, he is not the all. Not until he rids himself of this not being, thus you increase yourself when you get rid of everything else. And once you have gotten rid of it, the all is present in you. The Platonic life is about ascent to the one, ascent to the transcendent, ascent to this perfect, simple being, this ineffable being, above contemplation, above uh, predicates, above space-time, above any any conceivable thoughts, the God of Plotinus, the God of Augustine, the God of the Calvinists, is who this is. Massive, massive influence on Christianity through the, the generations. Uh, Plotinus, his, his legacy is long felt, although not very many people know who he was. You, you talk to people and they say, well, well, the ancient uh, church fathers, they were inspired by Aristotle. You don't know what you're talking about. It's all, it's all Plato, it's all Plotinus, it's all Neoplatonism. Aristotle is just a very minor factor in all of this, this idea. Plotinus, he is the wellspring from which most of this philosophy derives, in which most of this philosophy is systematized, in which most of this philosophy flows into Christianity through the, the means of people like Augustine. Again, not saying that uh, there wasn't Platonic influences before. You have Clement of Alexandria. You have Origen of Alexandria. You have Philo of Alexandria. You have the Alexandrian Gnostics. You have the Alexandrian document, the Barnabas. Oh, all these Alexandrian names just keep popping up. Hmm.
Hmm. Huh. Anyways, you like this episode, just leave a comment, leave a question, start a thread on the God is Open page. Thank you for listening. Thank you.